This collection is focused entirely on people playing the violin, which may seem to be an unusual choice of theme or focus for a photography collection. And it wasn't my original idea to start that, um, but it developed over time. Um, I became involved in the estate of an elderly couple who had both been musicians, and their effects had all kinds of different things, but they also had photographs, thousands of photographs. And these photographs came into my control. And because my interest was uh, a violin, my dirty little secret is that I used to play the violin. Not everybody knows that I did. I don't play anymore, but I did. And so the violin was kind of my natural focus. And I met, um, people who were involved in the International Center of Photography in New York, ICP. And I met the chief curator there, a man named Brian Wallace. And Brian was at the forefront of something that is happening in photography, even now, uh, which recontextualizes vernacular photography. <laughs> The most important idea, I think, um, in this collection, which I think is the idea that makes it worthwhile to be seen by a lot of people, is that the violin, I came to understand, is if not a unique object in the history of photography, then certainly a very rare one. Because the violin is often shown in photographs to show how wealthy a person is, to show how high-born they are, to show how sophisticated they are. But then that same object is used to show how humble people are and how from impoverished beginnings they are. And it's used to show geography that people choose to have a violin in a picture that may be the only time that their picture is ever taken in their lifetime. And the idea that these two or three or four or 10 different people are all holding exactly the same object, but yet each individually believing that that same object defines them in their difference is to me what, the, what makes the whole collection interesting and is how I continue to look for pictures to illustrate that idea. The first thought that I had was to think about where did the history of the violin intersect with the history of photography. And I found that there were two principal figures that came at very pivotal points in the history of photography. The first was Josef Joachim, who was probably the most famous violinist from perhaps 1860 to the end of the 19th century. And he was an early adopter of photography as a means to further his career. And so as he toured, he would find the most important portrait studio of whatever major city he was going to, and he would have that studio take a portrait of him, including by one of the most important portrait photographers of the 19th century, Julia Margaret Cameron. And so that became a kind of base point of where important violinists intersected with important photographers. We jump ahead 50 or 60 years, and we have Yasha Heifetz, known from a very young age that he was going to be one of the most important violinists of his time. And he came about at the moment of the real democratization of photography. Every single important portrait photographer of the time either wanted to take his portrait or was assigned to take his portrait. And he used this relentlessly to further his image in the world. 
And so that was a starting point for focusing how different violinists were engaging with photography on a professional level. People had violins in their photographs who were violinists. They were professional violinists and they wanted to be recorded for some reason. But then there were also people who didn't play the violin, who thought that the violin illustrated them in some way. So for example, at tintype studios in the um, late 19th century, you would have various props that they would offer you that you could hold in the scene. I was always looking for new places to find photographs. Look, where's some rock that I haven't looked under? And it was suge suggested to me that I start looking in the archives of the important photo agencies. One of the most important photo agencies is Magnum. And I found hundreds of pictures, lots of great pictures. But one of them by Eve Arnold, one of the most important uh, documentary photographers of the 20th century, was labeled something like Samuel Spuvak playing backstage at some London theater. And I thought, wait a minute, that's very close to the name of the couple that I was involved in the estate. And so I took a screenshot and I sent it to um, some people who knew the family. And I said, is this your dad? And the answer came back, yes. Somehow I put the pieces together and found a picture of Sam Spinak by Eve Arnold that uh, for me is the alpha and the omega of the collection. I always like to choose a few photographs that really highlight how vast the differences can be in what a violin in a picture is trying to illustrate. On the one hand, I have a photograph which is one of the earliest photographs in the collection. It's from 1853, and it's, of a, it's from a little girl. It's about a little girl with a violin. It's a studio portrait. Um, it's interesting photographically because the process is um, a wet collodion salted paper print. And then that print has been hand tinted very carefully and very beautifully. And it's of a quite large size for a photograph from 1853. Somebody spent a lot of money to show just how privileged and wealthy and sophisticated and well-born this little girl is. And of all the things those rich people could have chosen to put in a picture to illustrate that about their very sophisticated daughter, they chose a violin. And then on the other hand, we look at Joseph Kudelka's picture of Roma violinists at a village uh, celebration in the Czech Republic. Again, the violin is completely foregrounded. It's right up in front of the camera. And these are not wealthy people. These are not high-born people. These are gypsies, but the, the more correct term is Roma. And they are putting the violin to the camera specifically to say, look how Roma we are. And how often do we find a single object that can bridge two such differing cultures and meanings and still be the same thing. And I, I find that endlessly interesting. One of the fascinating things to me as I, as I compiled the collection and, and, and learned more about the effect of the violin um, in popular culture, for example, 
there's a portrait in the collection of Yasha Heifetz taken by uh, Alfred Eisenstadt. Mr. Heifetz in front of an orchestra, shot from below, about to play uh, a concerto with orchestra, and it was well publicized. But then when Hollywood chose to make movies about violinists, which they often did in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they would take a picture or, or organize a scene of their actor, whether it was um, uh, John Garfield, Tyrone Powell, to look like this photograph because the photograph of Eisenstadt had come to mean what a classical violinist looked like. And so they would pose their actors, who clearly couldn't play the violin, but were made to look like this pose of Heifetz. There's a figure, performer, comedian, actor, Jack Benny, and how he used the violin as a prop. He caricatured being a bad violinist as part of his uh, on-screen performance, but he was in fact a very serious violinist and, and, and could play quite well. And so it was this kind of where's Waldo experience to continually find all these different pictures of Jack Benny. But then my favorite is a picture of Jack Benny being held aloft on the shoulders of the Allied troops in Nuremberg Stadium at the end of World War II. And Jack Benny is on a chair held high above the soldiers' heads. You can just see a sea of soldiers' faces around him, and he's playing the violin. And uh, I think that uh, there's no easier message of how democratized the image of the violin is than in a picture like that. Two of my um, favorite um, pictures in the show, one is a huge stadium in Japan which is filled with five-year-old Japanese children playing the violin in a Suzuki festival, but then also a photograph of Junichiro Suzuki himself, of just him very quietly giving a lesson. And so I, 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 I love how the two of them talk to each other, that it was a worldwide movement, but also that he was this gentle and, and powerful pedagogue that uh, changed the course of how the violin is taught. I think what I've come to understand about this exhibit is that lots of people come to it from different directions and can find something satisfying in it from lots of different directions. I think if you're a photo geek and you really couldn't care less about the violin, there's lots to talk to you. I think if you are interested in the violin and you couldn't care less about photography, there's lots to talk to you. Because I think that the big overview of the show is that this one object has spoken to so many different people and that means that there are other things that can speak to lots of different people at the same time. That you can, that you can see the humanism of photography is available to everybody. Mm -hmm.